What it do, Hardwood Knox listeners? I am Dan Favalli, coming at you, as always, or almost always, with my super duper, incredibly esteemed, awesome times awesome, fantabulous, spectaculario, no longer worried about the Utah Jazz defense as much as he was during the preseason co-host, Andrew D. Bailey. We have some award predictions for you today. Before we get started, though, the usual mega important housekeeping notes. Most importantly, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Hardwood Knox on iTunes if you have not done so already. We can be found wherever else you're getting your podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Art19, Blog Talk, all that, all those good places. iTunes is still, however, the best way to let us know that you're out there, that you're listening. Definitely subscribe if you haven't already. Search Hardwood Knox on iTunes. Throw us that five-star rating. Write a review. Let us know what you want to hear, any feedback, or just tell us how amazing we are or how unamazing we are. We read those comments as well. We appreciate every single one. If you have done all those things, we ask that you continue helping us promote on Twitter. Retweet the podcast when we're tweeting it out, or you could just give a flat-out shout-out to us. We've seen a few of those as we've entered the NBA regular season, and we appreciate every single one of those shout-outs as well. Anything we could do to get some... Get some more people into our wonderful, glorious, amazing, spectaculario, you might even call it, Hardwood Knox community. Follow Hardwood Knox on Twitter, at Hardwood Knox. Then follow Andy on Twitter, at Andrew D. Bailey. I can be found at Dan Favalli, F-A-V-A-L-E. Last and certainly not least, you can find Blue Wire on Twitter, the network that sponsors us, at Blue Wire Pods. I'm tweeting from there, and you'll be able to check out some of the other great podcasts the network has to offer. And actually, the real final note before we get started is don't forget to check out uh, Axios, which puts together a great sports newsletter, really sorting through all the news and the stories that are out there to send the most important sports features, reporting, everything you need to know right to your inbox. It's one of the greatest subscription letters, sports.axios.com. Definitely go check it out. It's free and you won't regret it. It'll make your life so much easier, more convenient. Shout out to them, sports.axios.com. Andy, how the heck are you doing? I am excellent. Um, it's I'm going I'm to say something groundbreaking here. It's fun to have the NBA back, like real NBA games, That's night after night. Take. That's a terrible take. <laughs> I just love having, especially the, the non-TNT um, nights, although I still love inside the NBA, but those Wednesdays and Fridays when you can switch between like 10 games is just like heaven on earth for me. Do you ever get overwhelmed by that, though? Because I get a little bit overwhelmed. 11 I don't. games is a lot. Um, I, I love that there's, for, for every hour from the moment I get home from this silly lawyering job um, till the moment I go to sleep, there's like a different game that I can tune into. It's good. It's a gift and a curse. I need to more centralize my focus because if I get too caught up on those nights in like social media and flipping back and forth between games, I feel like I'm not taking in as much basketball knowledge that I need to and not. Uh, yeah. So on, on- I generally focus in on by the time the um, 9 p.m. Eastern game starts, I'm I'm settled into like either the Jazz or the Nuggets. Um, and then I'm usually settled into the late game too. So, but I, I hear you. There's, I'm probably not getting quite as much as I could if I'm just constantly flipping around. Yeah, I have to single out a game. So the first 11 game night of the season. Can you guess which game I was watching in the early in the early aughts of that night? Um, Bulls Hornets. It was. That was a great. That was a great yes. answer because that's exactly what it was. But that is Andy's league pass habits. That's what I'm. I'm gonna have to get in the habit of asking guests their league pass habits, just to find out how everyone else really consumes the NBA. And then, of course, yeah. our watchings are definitely impacted by what stories we're working on as well. Yeah. I was going to say, I was really excited last night. I was supposed to be writing about Bucks Rockets, which, uh, apologies to fan bases of either of those teams, but that, that was like a snoozer to me. Um, fortunately, we pivoted late in that game, and they let me write about Trey Young and the Hawks, which was much more uh, entertaining for me. I was supposed to cover two Zion games this week, and that did not, that did <laughs> <Whoops>. not happen. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, before we get into our awards predictions, we do have a couple news notes. Back at it, regular season style, although these are not the best news notes. Uh, we'll start with Marvin Bagley of the Sacramento Kings, out four to six weeks with a non-displaced fracture in his right thumb. 
that just sucks. Injuries suck. Mm -hmm. He finished the season really strong last year. I know the Kings really turned in a a stinker against the Suns to open the season, but he's a loss for them. And and even if you don't think he helps them win right now, his development's important. And so to lose him for that four to six week period during which he's going to miss, I I think I looked at it's going to be like 15 plus games. That's just big and annoying. Um. Yeah, big and annoying is probably a good way to describe it. I also like that you said that he might not help them win games right now. Um, the, his, his plus minus swing last year was really, really bad. Um, and and he was a minus again in a single game. And obviously single game plus minus, uh, you guys probably know what to do with that. But I'm with you. I was, I was in on uh, Marvin Bagley this season. I thought he was going to have a, a solid second year. Like you said, he looked really good in the second half of last season. I think he's a really interesting um, center. I know that they've played him mostly at power forward in his career, but I think if you have like a playmaking five, something that I think he's capable of, I think that opens up a lot of doors. So I was really looking forward to seeing if, if he could become that this season. And I guess it's on hold here for a little bit. Yeah, people have criticized his passing. I know he doesn't have the assist totals, but I think that the vision is there and he showed that he can make some really good reads last year. His shooting finished strong. And I, I think he's going to end up being a better defender than he's already being credited for because he seems super active even if he makes a ton of mistakes. And so just having that energy on defense or someone who's over-aggressive when they're this young to me is is more mm-hmm. encouraging than someone who's sort of underreacting to what's going on. I would totally agree with that, yeah. The The other one that we have is DeAndre Ayton. Phoenix Suns suspended 25 games for violating the NBA's anti-drug policy for testing positive for a diuretic. Uh, That was reported by Woj. DeAndre Ayton says he didn't realize what he was putting into his body. He subsequently did not test positive for anything else because, as people pointed out, diuretics are typically used to or sometimes used to mask the use of anabolic steroids. And so that follow-up report from Woj would lead him to believe he did not. Aiton apologized in a statement. I don't know if you saw the Sun statement about it, but that was not exactly supportive of Aiton. They closed out by saying they'll continue to develop him, but they that statement it was carefully worded, but they seemed super pissed. I didn't I didn't read the statement. Where is it? I'm uh, guessing it's on like their Twitter page or something. It was on Twitter and in, in Woj's initial report, uh, they just emphasized though that they were super disappointed in him. And it was just, to me, it was like a weird way to start off the letter. But again, I guess if you're losing what could really be your second or at least your third best player at this point, I, I definitely get um, the frustration. But their their statement was just, it, it was just not exactly the most supportive one of, of DeAndre Ayton. Yeah, you would think a statement on something like that would just say we're looking into it. Well, the NBA PA plans to... I, I did see that part of it. And they're going to expedite it in hopes of either getting um, a shorter suspension or having it rescinded entirely because there's something in the uh, collective bargaining agreement that accounts for inadvertent ingestion, essentially. And so that'll be something interested to monitor. And which is why I thought it was kind of wild that the Suns did not, you know, like come out with a different statement or maybe just like sort of hold serve. It was... They, I'll read it. It's on behalf of the Phoenix Suns organization. Coach Monty Williams and and I are disappointed in the actions by DeAndre Ayton that led to his testing positive for a banned diuretic and subsequent suspension by the NBA. This does not uphold the standards and principles we have set for the team, Suns general manager James Jones said. And they did note huh. DeAndre expressed his deepest remorse while he suspended will support him, yada, yada, yada. But very strongly worded at the start, I thought, for something that isn't technically <laughs> resolved just yet. I was going to say they're they're saying that I mean, what what reason is there to take a diuretic beyond um, the one that you already laid out to mask something else? They're, so they're they're implying that he did something wrong here. I mean, I guess he did by not being aware of what's going on. But like we're talking about borderline teenagers here. Mistakes happen. Yeah, that is a weird statement to me. So I don't know. Uh, the other thing that. We did, we did not – I actually did not have written down, and I just remembered it. Jetty Osmond, four-year contract extension worth $31 million with the Cleveland Cavaliers. I thought that was an interesting one to get done. He was not held to the same deadline as, as everybody else. What did you think of, of that money? I know he, he closed the season strong last year, and, and it seems like people are – not that they're out on him, but that they just don't 
pay attention to him anymore, but I'm just, I'm kind of intrigued. You get minutes from him at the, the small ball four after the all-star break last year, uh, Jetty averaged 14.9 points on a 42.9, 38.8 and 84.3 shooting slash. Uh, so that's just, he, he can score. He's an offensive weapon. He averaged 3.4 assists per 36 minutes during that time as well. And so I'm just intrigued. And I think four years, $31 million, it averages out to less than mid-level money. I think that's, that's a fine dice roll. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's exactly how I feel. The one thing that he's, I guess he's still fairly young. He's 24. So he, he is actually coming up on his prime here. Um, I, I thought he would show more as a passer last season, and maybe Cleveland just didn't trust him to. The ball was certainly in Colin Sexton's hands a lot, but Sexton is is more of a scorer than a distributor, so you would think there's a lane open for a playmaking wing. Um, and in some of the international competition I've seen him in, one of the things that stood out to me was maybe this guy can be a point forward. So I think if, if he can improve his passing a little bit, maybe if Cleveland gives him more responsibility as a passer, I think this contract will be A-OK. Like you said, it's it's a pretty low value. He doesn't have to he doesn't have to get a whole lot better than he already is for this to be a decent contract. Yeah, um, it's, it's and, on a declining scale too, which makes him eminently yeah. movable if they need. Yeah, him. so th- I, this it's a good deal I, for Cleveland, I would say. I don't know if he gets the chance. It did seem that he branched out his playmaking towards the end of the year last year, but I don't know how big of an opportunity. Yeah, now they have Garland, there, yeah. so that makes it even tougher. Porter and and with Colin Sexton, so yeah, but just. Just an interesting one. It was kind of just something to get done, and that'll be one to, to monitor. But I thought it was an interesting dice roll. Following a team you love in 2019 can be time-consuming. Trying to follow everything happening in sports is almost impossible. Scrolling through every app and visiting every website on a daily basis is impossible. That's why I subscribe to Axio Sports, the best free daily newsletter in the land. Axio Sports is a modern sports page delivered directly to your email inbox. When you sign up for free at sports.axios.com, you'll get the best stories from the NBA and NFL to cricket and ping pong and everything in between. Axio Sports also highlights the most important stats and trends, giving you the ability to stay informed. It's super simple to sign up. And again, it's free. Who doesn't love free? Sports.axios.com. Not only will you be caught up, You'll be the friend sharing an amazing link with your buddies. Join the 100,000 sports fans who get caught up on the day before it even begins. And best of all, there's no paywall, no subscription fee, absolutely nothing. This is free, curated sports content delivered directly to you. Sign up at sports.axios.com. Again, try for free at sports.axios.com. Are you ready to talk some year-end awards? Oh, uh, yes, I am. This was a bloodbath when we were filling this out. <laughs> yeah, it was not easy. Let's start with Rookie of the Year. <laughs> There's just awkward silence now because neither of us are confident in any single pick that we no. made, really. Because this is this is an impossible exercise any season, but it's it's especially impossible this year. There's been so much talk leading up to this season about how the title race is wide open. And that's certainly the same for MVP, which I'm sure we'll probably save for last. But it's it's these things are hard to predict for sure. You want to start with Rookie of the Year? Let's do it. Um, I'll give mine first. (laughs) So Zion Williamson, and you texted me this last night. He was a lock until all of a sudden he wasn't. Um, I know that they've said six to eight weeks on this meniscus. I would be shocked if he comes back even within the the latter half of that, the eight-week um, part of that timeline. I think he's going to be out for a little bit just because why <laughs> why do anything other than abundance of caution with this injury? Ooh, I like that phrasing. <laughs> so I think, I think they're going to take a while. They're going to be super careful with him, and he's still going to be the best rookie like when he's out there playing, but he, I just don't think he's going to have enough games. Um, and I think there's going to be a few other, you know, legitimate options who sort of um, rise to the top. It's not going to be quite like the Malcolm Brogdon, Joel Embiid situation where Embiid only played, what was it, 31 games yeah. his rookie year. And it was still enough for some people to vote for him because the next guy up, Malcolm Brogdon, who was good, just it just wasn't your typical rookie of the year campaign. I don't think he averaged much more than 10 points a game. That year, that's not the case this year. There's going to be guys who are going to perform. Um, 
John Morant's interesting. RJ Barrett is interesting, and I emphasize him because that's my pick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, I so and and I think I've probably griped about him on this podcast. I know I have on Twitter. Um, there are there are some little Harrison Barnes vibes that I got from him when he was at Duke. Um, so I'm a little bit worried, but he has shown some playmaking, playmaking ability, especially in college. He's going to get a lot of opportunities on the Knicks. I know they brought in a bunch of veterans this summer, but I don't think it'll take too long before this team realizes we're not going to be very good this year. Um, so let's turn it over to the young guys. And I think when that happens, RJ is going to get a ton of shots. I think he averages high teens in points, probably four or five assists, four or five rebounds. Um, and, and his, his efficiency won't be great, but with Zion out for as long as I think he'll be out, then, then I think it's going to go to RJ Barrett. And then my last runner up was a dark horse, Kendrick Nunn. (laughs) He scored 40 points in a game in the preseason. He started for them in their first game. I know Jimmy Butler was out. Um, I think he might've even been their leading scorer in that first game. Did he have, I think he had 24 points. Um, so that, that that's a random one that I don't think I ever would have said even like a week or two ago. Um, but all of a sudden he looks like he's, he's going to be a part of this heat rotation. And I correct myself. He Winslow had 27 in Miami's opener, but Kendrick Nunn had 24 on 10 of 18 shooting. Um, I think he's forced his way into that rotation and he, I, it, to me, it looks like he's he's probably going to average double figures, and so that's interesting. I know it's weird to leave John Moran off, but he's none scoring ability has just really wowed me here over the last couple of weeks. You including him is kind of wild because I don't know how he's <laughs> guaranteed a spot in the rotation long term on what what should be a playoff team. But interest, I took a I took a dice roll here too, and I share your thoughts on on Zion Williamson. Even if he comes back within that timetable, we're looking at between twenty one and twenty eight games missed that might be enough if you have other healthier rookies to kind of just derail the Zion rookie of the year campaign. If he comes Mm -hmm. back and he's just so dominant, maybe it won't matter, but you can't even assume if he returns within that window that he then plays in every game, that would just be irresponsible. So he is not my number one. John Morant is uh, the first game of the season. Doesn't necessarily support this. I I thought he was going to maybe get more minutes. And then he's really just the only primary playmaker type they have. And he's someone I could see, finishing in the top five, top eight of assists per game, certainly top 10. So, and, and with his scoring ability, his escapism off the dribble, and again, that vision, I really think that's going to end up taking people off guard as they get to see more Grizzlies games, even if it's on accident or because the Grizzlies happen to be playing their team. Uh, he's someone that I think is going to have a, a super strong case. I have Zion as my runner-up, just out of respect for how dominant I think Zion's yeah. going to be, so just like you. And then my third, P.J. Washington. Seven three-pointers in the Hornets opener, and that's not the only reason I picked him. I saw uh, some of him in the preseason. So much more plug-and-play than I realized. I got giddy when the Hornets put him and Miles Bridges as the center and power forward, respectively. Those lineups are going to be bad defensively to start, and they're probably never going to be good at rebounding. But watching all the stuff that P.J. Washington is able to do off the ball, he's already kind of an irritant on defense. He makes pretty smart help reads for a rookie. I'm so impressed with what he can do. Even just showed a little bit of moxie when he has the ball in his hands on the offensive end. I think they can get to a point where they really use him as a screener too. The Hornets are not going to be good, but P.J. Washington is going to have the ultimate green light. And that's, look, I'm going to tell you right now, it would not shock me. There are probably so many candidates to win if you don't include Zion as the winner. And R.J. Barrett could certainly be one of them. I just don't trust the Knicks' rotation or the consistency of deployment with him. I would not be shocked if P.J. Washington ends up being the first runner-up or maybe even making a stronger play than we realized to win the award. Yeah, I think that's a that's a decent call. Um, I was surprised by what he did in that opener, and it was a big part of why the Hornets were able to beat the Bulls. I have one more note on Kendrick Nunn before I move on, by the way. Um, his, his last season of college basketball, he shot 11.3 points per game and shot 39.4% on them well <laughs> yeah wild 11.3 threes per game 39.4 percent that's just, that's just insane volume and efficiency um all right six man of the year how about you start this one this one was just tough i picked spencer dimwitty as my as my first guy i think the nets are going to lean on him 
in Kevin Durant's absence, and there will be nights where he's kind of their second best player. Karis LeVert doesn't really seem to have that every night attack mode in him just yet. And he might have been my pick last year, even over Lou Williams, had he played in in more games and his shooting percentage didn't plummet towards the end of the season. Uh, This is someone who ranked in the 86th percentile of scoring efficiency out of the pick and roll last year and 85th percentile of isolation scoring. Not the best finisher around the rim, but he got to the line more often than any Brooklyn non-big last year. He's going to have to kind of fulfill that same role this season. Kyrie's never been someone who gets to the line a ton. Maybe Karis LeVert, who I'll be talking about later, can and can enter that conversation. But I, I like what he's going to need to do for Brooklyn. I think the Nets are going to be the right combination of of good, but really need to be dependent on him. And so his his volume, I think, really throws him in there. And will he score enough might be a fair question because of how tightly tethered this award is to, to volume scoring. I think he'll he'll be right up there. If he can, if he matches what he put up last year, which was around like 16 points a game, 17 points a game, I believe, uh, he'll be perfectly fine, and you, you throw in his playmaking. I was tempted to go with Lou Williams, who is my, my first runner-up, because this really might need to be renamed the, the Lou Williams Award. Yeah. We, you know, we talk about how it should have been renamed Jamal Crawford Award, and he's an excellent guy, but Lou Williams is just an absolute monster. He will be baiting guys into to, to leaving their feet uh, on his pump fakes until he's probably like 80. And so <laughs> you talk about a volume scorer. I, I almost picked him to win. It's just I don't know what his role is going to look like in Los Angeles once Paul George returns. Will we see him close as many games? They might not have a choice because he's just so damn good. And then I'm stepping out on a ledge with this one. Eric Gordon's my 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 second runner up. Mm-hmm. He's the way that the Rockets are going to stagger James Harden and Russell Westbrook. He's just going to be even more paramount because I think Mike D'Antoni said he only plans on pe- playing Harden and Westbrook about 19 minutes a game together, and that includes crunch time. So you have to believe that when they play their solo minutes, Gordon will be on the court with with both of them. And so not just his shooting, but the distance from where that's coming from is going to be huge. He can do some stuff off the dribble. And then we've seen them turn to him to defend some wings. And that's certainly going to be something he has to do if they go with the three guard lineup ever for small spurts. He did not shoot well in this season opener against Milwaukee, but the the trick with this is to not let those really small sample sizes sway you one way or the other. And uh, he ended up being my second runner up. I think those all make sense. Um, uh, particularly think Lou Williams makes sense because that's my pick. Um, I think your concern is certainly valid. Like what, what happens to him when Paul George comes back? There's certainly going to be a smaller uh, share of the offense for him to carry. But he, he has looked <laughs> – I mean he's he's been one of the better offensive players in the league for I would say four or five years now, uh, maybe even longer. Um, basically since that last season in Toronto, he's, he's just been fantastic in this role, this, this very specific role that he has. And he's, he's even better at it with the Clippers because he's got this running mate in Montrez Harrell that like their chemistry is just really awesome to watch. Um, they, they were a big part of why the Clippers were able to sort of turn that Lakers game around in the opener and, and get things going on the right track. For them, obviously, Kawhi Leonard is the star. Paul George is the star. But I think these two are still going to get plenty of opportunities to feast both with those guys and without them. And I, I think that, you know, Kawhi and PG are going to take some shots away from Lou Williams, but they're also going to demand a lot of defensive attention. And I think Lou Williams could get, you know, a lot of easy looks because he plays with these guys now. So there, there's kind of two sides to that for me. So he's he is my pick. Um, I, I'm guessing he'll probably be the first guy to win it four times if if he does win it this year. Um, then my second pick is I already mentioned him, Montrez Harrell. I, I think you know he was certainly in the running last season. And if the Clippers are going to continue to start Zubats, which is what they've done in the first two games, and um, every time Zubats plays well, I kind of chuckle because. Um, that was just an odd deal to me by the Lakers, but <laughs> <laughs> Montrez Harrell in that, you know, heat check big man off, off the bench. Those two together are just incredible. Um, and I think they're going to be incredible all season. And then my last one is kind of off the beaten path. I went with Rudy Gay. Um, 
The Spurs, I think if they're going to be good, are going to rely on their bench heavily again. That was that was the reason they were pretty good last season. Um, the, the bench lineups had had really good plus minuses last year. I think it could be a similar situation this year. Right now, Derek White is coming off the bench. Uh, Rudy Gay is coming off the bench. They have some of their better players uh, in the reserve role, and I think the leading scorer of that bunch is probably going to be Rudy Gay, who's had a fun like late career resurgence with the Spurs. And so if the storyline becomes, you know, San Antonio's bench is carrying them again, which is, it's not new. It's something that's happened with them many times. Um, maybe, maybe Rudy Gay gets the narrative points of he's the leader of this great bench mob. The only thing I'll say is that if the Clippers once again have the two top six man of the year vote getters, it's just not fair. Yeah, it's ridiculous. The depth on that team combined with the star power is just out of this world. It's ridiculous, yep. Most improved player, which is always tough. The way I approach this is I still tend to to shy away from picking second-year players just because it doesn't feel uh, right when they're going from their rookie to sophomore seasons. I went uh, – well, actually, it's your turn to go first. Who did you pick? I went with Bam at a bail. Um, I thought that was a good pick. Yeah, he he's in his third season now, um, and I'm with you. I I don't I don't typically like going first to second year guys, um, so I just barely got outside that window with Bam Adebayo because he's coming into his third season. But what I was thinking was, I I want to look for guys who were already good last year. They're just going to get a bigger opportunity this season, and that's that's clearly the case with Bam Adebayo. Um, Hassan Whiteside is obviously gone. He's now a Portland Trailblazer. It's it's clearly Bam's job now, the starting center position. And I think he does a lot of things pretty well. He handles the ball well for a big man. Um, his shooting touch and some of the lead-up to the Team USA stuff was really impressive to me. I think he can pass a little bit. Um, he can defend on the perimeter far better than Whiteside did. I think that was a big part of why he started to play over him last season. Um, so again, this is a guy that I think was already good. He's just going to get a lot more opportunities, uh, this season. Then my runner up, this is, um, I don't know. This one's kind of out of the blue, but Luke Kennard scored 30 points in their opener. I think he's going to have to be really good for the Pistons to be even decent because they're, they're going to be strapped for shooting, um, this season. And if, if, Blake Griffin is out who believe it or not was there like he was their primary shooter last season. I, 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 he led the team in attempts and makes, I'm pretty sure um, they're going to need some shooting. I think Luke Kennard can provide that. And I, I think he's going to score plenty for them. And then I went for a sentimental pick on the last one. I'm, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite as excited as everybody is. Everybody else is about the first um appearance of Markel Fultz this season, but I really want him to be good after everything that we saw uh, the first couple of years of his career. Uh, maybe he's healthy again. I don't, I, from the videos I've seen, there's still a hitch in that shot. I don't know if you agree with me. Uh, I, I don't know if people are just ignoring that, um, but he looks really explosive. Um, he can defend multiple positions. He's a good rebounder for a guard. He's a, he's a good shot blocker. Um, so even if he's not like off the charts efficiency wise, I think he could be a really solid, helpful player, especially in a bench role. So he's he's my last pick for this one. It would be a tough sell for me to pick him just because he had a 33 game sample size for his career coming into this. And so he yeah. also feels like a sophomore, if not basically a rookie. But if he's good, that jump could be more than incremental. And so you look for those monster yeah. leaps and he would certainly be someone who qualified. Uh, I picked DeJounte Murray. Also, maybe a little bit of a cop-out because he didn't play last season, but he is in his fourth year, and he was all defense in 2017-2018, and I basically feel as if he's going to be a guy that really ups his scoring, control over the Spurs' his playmaking, maybe shows a little bit more with his jump shot. He he did a good job uh, hitting some of his threes in the preseason. It doesn't look like he's going to take a ton of them in, in the regular season, but he, his defense looks like it's back, and so if you combine that with – an uptick in, in scoring and just higher assist totals. You know, I could see this being a season where he averages, you know, 17, eight, and then like two steals per game or something like that. And if he shows any semblance of a jumper, be it from long range or from mid range, that'll end up being huge. And that's my pick to win it. Karis LeVert is number two for me. People 
I don't know if they've forgotten, but maybe they've forgotten because of what D'Angelo Russell did after Karis LeVert got injured last year. He was the Nets' best player for the first part of the season. He was the reason yeah. why D'Angelo Russell was watching some games from the bench in crunch time. He's a great secondary playmaker. He's someone who can get you 20 points per game. I don't think that he'll average that. Uh, but if he sniffs it and he's handing out like four assists per game or something like that, shooting well off the dribble, he really showed that he could do that towards the end of last year. And then even in the playoffs against Philly, the Nets lost, but he was carrying their offense for stretches and he shot a pretty good percentage on, on pull-up jumpers. Very interested to see what his development ends up being, especially because after all those extensions we saw, and we will have a podcast on those next week to go through them, his three-year $52 million deal looks like a borderline bargain should he stay healthy. My stubbornness has me picking Brandon Ingram as the, the <laughs> second runner-up. I don't, have a great feel for this, but he does look like he's unafraid to take threes uh, in the flow of the offense since joining New Orleans and operating within the flow of the offense is big for him. I think there'll be more opportunity there for him now that Zion Williamson's going to miss at least a quarter of the year. It still doesn't, you know, during the preseason, then uh, definitely during the, the, their, the start of their regular season, it just doesn't, he doesn't look like he fits incredibly into an, an offensive system, but he can still do things off the dribble. And I think the fit will get there. The opportunity will be there if he's healthy enough. I feel like this could be the year where I'd be surprised if he won it, but I feel like this is the year that he could actually get a substantial amount of votes for it. He looks uh, already better than I expected him to uh, this season. I'm, I might be back in on, Brandon Ingram. You know Surprise, what? I'm not sure surprised. if we're I'm taking like... any any new members, especially ones that vacated <laughs> already. I was going to say, I'm sure you're shocked to see me waffling on a player's uh, <laughs> potential. Defensive player of the year? Was that a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a question to you. I think you're up first this time. I have Joel Embiid. I was tempted to go with Rudy Gobert again, Ooh. but I, I think the voter fatigue is just going to be real. This isn't even a concern for how the Jazz defended in, in the preseason. Uh, they they defended better in their opening game against uh, Oklahoma City. So I, I like I could see him winning it again, but it's just three years in a row seems really tough. And Philly might end up having the best defense in the league. To me, they're definitely going to have top three. I'd be a little bit surprised if they fell out of that. And Embiid is going to be the, the anchor of that defense. Although Josh Richardson getting around screens is is kind of a res- re- revelation. Uh, it seems yeah. like he's... He's just he's a beast in that regard, but I I feel like it'll be a recognition of the best defender on what could be the best defensive team. I do have Rudy Gobert as the first runner up, so he could be right there. This is all subject to change when we do a midseason pick for this. Just the Jazz are probably going to be really good defensively again, and he's just the anchor of of everything that they do. He's you know even more so than Embiid, he informs what the Jazz do on the perimeter and it's just very rare that you see bigs impact the game to that extent where the the ball handlers are actively funneled towards them and so he's just a monster around the rim the best rim protector in the nba by far it would not shock me if he picked it up uh, for a third time i went with Giannis attentacupo for the second runner up i don't feel great about it I, the, I almost wanted to go with Kawhi Leonard, but I feel like he's less of an every possession bulldog now. And then mm-hmm. I'm, I'm banking on him at least being load managed a little bit. Giannis Antetokounmpo just still has that every possession effort where, you know, every play is basically his will in miniature. And I, I could <laughs> see that if the Bucks are going to be as good as last year, and they could be because the Eastern Conference is, is pretty shallow towards the top. He's just going to have to have a, a monster season on the defensive end because they did lose a little bit of, of defensive portability in, in Malcolm Brogdon. And some of the wings that they're going to be relying on, Wesley Matthews has has lost a step. Um, Kyle Korver, we, he's been unplayable in the playoffs over the past couple of seasons basically because of his defense and if, if his shot's not going in. So they just don't have the best secondary wing rotation right now. And that's just going to heighten the importance of what Antetokounmpo needs to do. And I've always thought that because he gets all these assists and scores all these points and the manner in which he scores all these points, that his defense has almost become overlooked. There was, I know there was clamoring for him to win defense player of the year last year. That might've then overrated his defense, but he feels like someone who should finish in the top three of this voting. I think that's fine. He's the guy who's probably going to stack up a lot of blocks and steals too. Um, 
which is something that people always look at. Hashtag and, counting stats. <laughs> I will begrudgingly um, have Joel Embiid in my top three as well. I I like Embiid. I don't know if it's like shtick that I um, – That you threw the word begrudgingly in there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or that I booed when you said that he would win. Um <laughs> I went with Gobert, and maybe it's because I love um, Gobert and Jokic, and so I subconsciously dislike uh, Embiid. Maybe that's what's going on here. Um, But I I did go with Rudy Gobert. Can you guess how many people have won Defensive Player of the Year three years in a row? Three years in a row? Yeah. I'm going to say one. You are correct, and you probably know which one. Kyle Korver? (laughs) Bill Bill Russell? Uh, Dwight Howard. Oh, I forgot it was him that did it. Yeah, in the in the prime of the Dwight Howard years. Um in in his prime, which was slightly uh less effective than Rudy Gobert's prime. But I oh, that's that's a the shade uh, emanating out of this podcast right now. <laughs> that's another <laughs> point for another podcast. Um so I think Gobert's gonna win it. I think he gets three in a row, and I think it's because he's he's gonna have an even bigger responsibility this season. Um, having like the secondary rim protection of Derek Favors, I think was, was a pretty underrated aspect of what made Utah's defense so good over the last few years. And now Gobert is, uh, in a lot of ways, just sort of out on an Island defensively. Um, and he's, he's going to be out on an Island on a lot of different possessions. I think Donovan Mitchell and Conley are both like decent perimeter defenders, but they're just small. And that's, that's something that you have to overcome, um, as a defender. So, and, and Bogdanovich is going to get blown by, I think, plenty. I think Joe Ingles is a good defender. He's certainly not quick, but he's he's generally in the right pos- position. O'Neal's a good defender. Um, but there's there's really no no one else who has anywhere near the responsibility Gobert does on defense, at least on that team. So I think they're going to be good defensively. I think he's going to be clearly the anchor. So that's why I went with him. Joel Embiid, again, um, I've got him number two. Same, it's the same one two finishes last year, right? Uh, Ana Dacumpo was third. So Philly, Philly's defense is going to be absurd. I think there may be a little bit of, well, who's mostly responsible for this? Is it Embiid? Is it Josh Richardson? Is it Horford? Um, so maybe that pulls away a little bit from some of the votes that he gets. Um, maybe it's Matisse Teibel, who probably gets some MVP votes as well, based on the conversation surrounding him. Um so there's there's just a lot of defensive talent on the Sixers. Then <clears throat> I went with another team that I think is going to be really good defensively in my second runner up position in the Clippers. And they th- this is another team that could have multiple guys who chase this award. Philadelphia is one, and then the Clippers are another. You mentioned Kawhi Leonard, um, although I agree with you that that he's not quite the consistent defensive force that he used to be. Paul George, he's going to miss some time, but he's a fantastic perimeter defender when he gets back. Uh, and then I went with Patrick Beverly, who to me, it, there already seems to be more of a focus on this guy than there has been in years past. The Clippers are going to be talked about constantly. He's going to be on national TV a ton. People are going to see this sort of <laughs> maniacal, all he cares about is defense player consistently all season long. And if the Clippers have a really good defense, I think when people are like, hmm, what's, what's the reason – for this really good Clippers defense, they're going to look at him as as the leader. He quietly finished in the top ten of voting last year. Oh, I didn't even realize that. And Joel Embiid was fourth last year, so he almost. Oh, I thought to he be. was one in the top three. How did what? I he messed was, that up. He was fourth. Uh, Gobert was first, followed by Antetokounmpo, Paul George. Joel Embiid was fourth. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Was in, did Embiid finish second the first year that Gobert won it? Um, I can look that up immediately. He Check. did. He was number two, and Anthony Davis was number three that year. Okay, that's what I was thinking of. All Every right. guy looks better and feels more confident when he puts on a suit. But there's one problem. Guys keep buying generic off-the-rack suits. That's why Blue Wire's pumped the partner with Indochino for an amazing deal on a new suit. Indochino is the world's leading made-to-measure menswear company. They make suits and shirts to your exact measurements for an unparalleled fit and comfort. Looking to get married? They have tons of options for those looking to outfit their wedding party. It's so easy to get started. 
visit a stylist at one of Indochino's 40 showrooms in North America and have them take your measurements personally, or measure yourself at home and shop online at Indochino.com. This week, Hardwood Knox listeners can get any premium Indochino suit for just $369 at Indochino.com when entering Blue Wire at checkout. Plus, shipping is free. That's Indochino.com promo code Blue Wire for any premium suit, and it'll cost you just $369 to go along with free shipping. This is an incredible deal for a premium made to measure suit. Once you go custom, Indochino promises you you won't go back. All right. We move on to Coach of the Year. This was probably my toughest one. Yeah, this is impossible. Who do you, <laughs> who do you have? Spoiler, this is the only one that oh, did we have we have a match here. So Yeah. You can and I I did my picks pick for both of us. I did my picks before you sent me um the sheet to fill this out. And so I was like shocked because there's so many different directions you could go with coach of the year. I was really surprised we had the same one. I went with Mike Malone. Um, Denver's going to be really good, <laughs> possibly the number one seed in the West. So that's one ingredient to winning coach of the year. Um, he's got a lot of talent to manage. I think he, he's, he's put together a fun sort of egalitarian offense. Um, I, I, I think he, lifts them defensively. He was sort of known as a defensive guy before he came to Denver and they have a lot of players who are not known as defensive players. So if they have a solid defense, they're near the top of the standings in the West and they're, they're one of the most enjoyable teams to watch. I think those are all good ingredients for him. Um, my, my runner up is Brett Brown. I think Philly could have the best record in the East. So, you know, similar ingredient to what I just laid out with Malone. Brett Brown has an added sort of narrative quality, um, the fact that he had to suffer through the process, <laughs> I think some, vo- it. yeah, I, I think some voters may take that into account and say, you know, he's, he powered through that and now he's got this really good team and he managed that to a number one record or a number one seed in the East. Um, and then I went with Quinn Snyder, another Homer pick for me. Um, he's, I believe he's finished in the top three already at some point in his career. Um, I think Utah is going to be really good. I, I think we're going to get to see what he can do offensively as a coach for really the first time this season. When he was first hired by Utah, there was all this talk about how he had written a pick and roll manifesto and he was like this offensive savant, but Utah just didn't have the players, um, to, to put all that stuff into practice. And so now I think he finally has a more offensively talented roster. So it'll be really interesting to see what he does with it. Um, so those are my three picks, but again, I think, I think you could probably go, you, you could make a case for like 10 to 15 guys on this one. Yeah. That's what I was, the point I was going to make. And the ones that could, well, so I picked the Mike Malone as well for my number one. And the thing, the only thing I'll add to your case is for people that think the roster continuity benefits him, it does, but they quietly have a ton of free agents. And so you talk about managing talent, that becomes even more imperative this year just because, you know, Paul Millsap last year of his deal, Mason Plumlee expiring contract. Jeremy Grant has a player option is new to the fold. Juan Hernan Gomez, Malik Beasley, Torrey Craig, uh, they're all going to be free agents this summer. And so you have to – some of these guys are not going to get consistent minutes. And so he doesn't have the – the easiest of jobs. He's my number one pick. Not that I feel particularly confident in it, but like you said, the Nuggets are going to be good. Greg Popovich is number two, just because everyone, not everyone, but there's, we've gotten into the point where people have the Spurs being the ones left out of the playoffs. It does seem like they are more, the majority is wanting to to pick the Blazers to miss the playoffs than the Spurs, but it, it's Greg Popovich. And so if the Spurs end up flirting with 50 victories again, when everyone has them in that like 44, 45, 46 range, uh, that's going to hugely help him. And if, if they're good, not like in general, when they just amid all that clunky spacing, if you don't end up trading DeRozan and you have DeJounte Murray and Derek White's not much of a shooter, you'll have to give it up to him, especially if they end up ranking the top five of offense again. Steve yeah. Clifford is my second runner up because the Magic look like if Markel Falls is going to be good, they have shock and awe potential in the East. I don't know if I'd say they could get the third seed, but it, it wouldn't shock me then if Markel Fultz is good and you have Mo Bamba who can actually give you minutes. They're also my one of my candidates, probably that'd be a good topic for a future podcast that I could see making it's kind of a semi-substantial trade this season when you look at how many players they have in the front court. But they, their defense looks like it's going to be pretty good. If they can ever get some 
some consistency on offense, that only boosts his case. But if we talk about someone that sneaks in the top four in the East, uh, I wouldn't put it past uh, the voters to, to give him some due. But there's, there, like you said, there are just so many other coaches. And I think you can go through the typically like good coaches, Doc Rivers uh, with the Los Angeles Clippers, Brad Stevens, if the Celtics yeah. don't end up sucking. But what about like the young teams that could be – better than we expect Lloyd Pierce in Atlanta. They flirt with yeah. the playoff spot. Uh, Chicago fans won't want to hear this, but if the Bulls are in the playoffs, Boylan's going to get some love. Uh, Rick Carlisle in Dallas, all those types of, of coaches. So even Alvin Gentry, if the Pelicans make the playoffs while navigating the Zion injury, coach of the year is just a gauntlet of candidates. Yeah. Dan Tony, if he, yeah. if he can figure out how to make uh Harden and Westbrook work, work together, it they really is fired first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It really is impossible to pick that one. If you were to pick a coach that's going to get fired first this year, who would it be? Oh, man, that's on the spot. Um, maybe D'Antoni, since he's already had his entire staff axed, um, plus you know everything else. It, I, it's either D'Antoni or Vogel. That's what I'm going to say. Vogel's, because Vogel's probably the smart pick. The, the, I, I love uh, – do you follow Damon Rangula Oh, yeah, on he's Twitter? hysterical. <laughs> I love, I love how he always calls Jason Kidd Kittlefinger. I don't know if he came up with that, um, but that's brilliant. Um, Jason Kidd is is uh, angling for that job. There's there's no question about it. Um, and there's there's always the typical like LeBron coach drama. There that's gonna happen at some point this season. I would be shocked if it didn't. So I'm gonna go with those two. Um, expectations and, uh, you know, big, big personalities to manage. So those those are the ones I would keep an eye on. I could see Nate McMillan, too. Mm. If the Pacers are just bad and the Sabonis-Turner pairing isn't working out, does look like it at the start, they, their first game together, it, it looked fine. They did lose. But that's just – that's a team to monitor to me because they invested in it like they're the surefire quasi-contender in the East. And if they're not that, I think the noise maybe gets a little loud coming out of there. What, I guess this doesn't mean anything, but hasn't he finished in top three for coach of the year recently too? He was I guess that's like a kiss of death for some coaches, but. Yeah. So, I mean, look, <laughs> look at how many former coaches of the year were fired. Yeah. yeah. George Carl was fired like right after he won it. I, I'll always remember that. Um, so that's, that's a good question. That's maybe one I need to think about more, but I think Vogel and D'Antoni are probably pretty good picks. On to executive um, of the year. I think this yeah. is... I was going to say another awkward silence. That's like... Uh, well, this is my turn to go first, right? You did, Coach. Yep. So yeah, go for it. I picked Lawrence Frank. I mean, the Clippers got Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. I don't really... Like, while not torpedoing their mm-hmm. depth. You got to keep Jermichael Green, Patrick Beverly, Zubats. I don't I don't even need to justify that. It'll be, it'll be a shock if he doesn't win. David Griffin's my runner-up. Just to come out with the roster that he did when being forced into a situation where you had to trade Anthony Davis. The Pelicans, I will not say they are better off without Anthony Davis. They are better off without the saga and that cloud of his future hanging over their head, certainly. Talent-wise, you'd rather have you'd rather have the top five player. Maybe some people would rather have Zion as a building block, but the goal of teams isn't necessarily to, to build. If you could swap out Zion for Anthony Davis on this roster, although Anthony Davis's departure is responsible for a large part of this roster when you look at yeah. not only who the Lakers gave him, but what he parlayed uh, the draft pick into, ending up with Nick Keel, Alexander Walker, who looks like he's going to end up being a steal. However you want to look at it, Unless the Pelicans are just terrible, I feel like he's going to get a lot of love for that. And then one we're not talking about enough to me, Sean Marks. The Nets got Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. I know Kevin Durant's injured. He also made some nice moves on the margin, bringing in David Nwaba for Brooklyn. Maybe Wilson Chandler works out when he comes back from the suspension. Garrett Temple's a solid veteran. He gets the the Karis LeVert extension done before all these huge numbers start flying out for Buddy Heald and Jalen Brown. And I know Karis LeVert's more of an injury risk, but but still, I thought that was good value for him uh, to get that done. That's just someone I feel like we're sleeping on in the executive of the year conversation. I like your picks better than mine for this one. Um, I think you should just say that about all my picks. <laughs> uh, one, never. Two, um, I, think, I think sometimes executive of the year, it's not like a lifetime achievement award, but it's like a four or five year achievement award. And right. for what for what Sean Marks has done with the Nets since he took over, 
it's it's incredible that he took them from where they were to where they are now. Uh, so he he deserves some love. David Griffin too. I the the speed of that rebuild is very impressive to me. This is another one that I was. Uh, and this one I wasn't as surprised that we picked the same one because it does feel kind of obvious. I went with Lawrence Frank uh, for the Clippers assembling. Their team is <laughs> just unfair. The, yeah, just the team unfair. that they have is is ridiculous. Um, we've seen so many times over the last several years when when you put together your super team, you have to gut the rest of the roster, and they just didn't have to do that. Um, they're so good at the top and so deep. Um, one of the one of the best rosters I think we've seen in a long time with the Clippers, at least on paper. Um, I have Dennis Lindsay as a runner up. Lots of jazz around this thing for me. Um, <laughs> he's another guy who has finished in the top three before, and I think he's well. And I guess um, I don't know if there's any differentiation between vice president and general manager for this award. I wonder if it would be Justin Zanuck now. But I'm going to go with Dennis Lindsay, and then. Uh, the last one I went with was Elton Brand. They lost Jimmy Butler, but I, I think what they've assembled is pretty impressive, too. Th- that's a starting five that stacks up against anyone in the league. I think Horford is is going to help them a lot. I think Josh Richardson is going to be awesome. Their defense is going to be fantastic. There's questions about the depth, for sure. But I think when you have potentially the best starting five uh, in the NBA, you can you can get away with a lack of depth. So... Maybe he gets some buzz as well, but I. This is another one where you could probably make a case for a bunch of guys, especially coming off this summer when there was so much player movement. Um, I saw the other day that I, I think it was like forty three percent of players in the league are on the same roster as they were last season, Jeez. which is the lowest ever. Yeah, it's just crazy. Less than half the league, so it could be like you know, whichever one of these teams that went through an overhaul pops the most that that could be the guy who wins executive of the year. It's it's probably going to be the Clippers. They probably fit that definition, but um, there's there's a lot of different ways you could go with this prediction. MVP, who you got? All right. Um, I went with Giannis. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how much explanation it needs. He fouled out with like five or six minutes to play last night and had a 30-point triple-double. Um, he's going to put up monster numbers. The team is built to make him – to, to really emphasize his strengths. Um, they have good players, but not great players who are going to take numbers away from him. So I think he's going to have another absurd stat line. I think the bucks are going to be really good. Um, repeat is not an uncommon thing with the MVP. You mentioned voter fatigue with, with defensive player of the year. I think with the MVP, it that kicks in around the third year, which is what you said for Gobert as well. Um, so I think I think Giannis is my number one. I was really tempted to put Jokic at number one. I just I have a hard time seeing the voters buying it to the same extent that I do. Um, he's going to have ridiculous numbers too. I think there's there's still going to be the narrative floating around that he's not great defensively. That'll hurt him. Um, I, I think he'll probably still have some nights where he kind of takes a game off whether it's, you know, through frustration or whatever it may be. Um, but I <laughs> I think there's a real chance he wins it. If Denver's number one and he's averaging like 22, 12, and 8 or something like that, he's got to get um, some votes. Then I went with Kawhi, number three, another one that I don't think requires a ton of explanation. He's looked outrageous in these first couple of games. Um then I went with Embiid, four. He's so similar with, I, I, I think, a lot of these picks is he's going to be on a really, really good team. He's clearly going to be viewed as the leader of that team. Um, so I think he's going to get some votes. And then I, it's almost like we have to put James Harden in here by default just because yeah. he's always in the MVP conversation. And he'll probably rise higher than fifth. I mean, he's he's been a staple of MB, MVP talk for three, four, five years now. So he's my fifth. Um this is another one. I we could probably make arguments for more than five guys uh, for MVP. Everything is just so so wide open this year. Yeah, I'm sticking with my preseason pick, Stephen Curry, and then I rounded out with Giannis, Antetokounmpo, <laughs> Kawhi Leonard, Nicole Jokic, James Harden. My notes are: I'm fully prepared to walk back the Curry pick. 
but I'm trying not to overreact the Warriors lost to the Clippers. It's it's a one game. Their defense is terrible though, and I don't know that they're gonna be in enough meaningful games or win enough for it to matter. My my second pick would probably be Giannis Attentacumpo, but Kawhi Leonard, if the Clippers are this good, I go back yeah. and forth between does he get the narrative that he carried them without Paul George or just the depth the depth hurt him? I think when we do this mid season, I almost feel like I'll be walking back hard the Stephen Curry pick and focusing on a Tentacumbo or Leonard. And I do think Jokic at least finishes in the top five of MVP voting. Uh, th- like you said, though, this is just such a wide open race, and there are, there are all these different narratives that'll be floating around. I will, however, say though that if the Warriors end up being competent and are in the playoff picture, Stephen Curry is going to have a hell of an MVP case he's, because you look at that yeah, roster and some of the he's going to have to be out. outrageous. Yeah, I was going to say after you finish your top five, we should talk about how the Warriors are just bad. I'm not ready to overreact after one game. I'm trying to keep a level head, and I left him as my MVP pick. But their defense is going to age Draymond Green by no less than two decades. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. Did you name your third yet? Yeah, I just went through my list because it was so similar to yours. I have Steph at one, Giannis Giannis at two. There's just one star going to carry his team, probably be this one or two seed in the East. Kawhi Leonard, obviously without Paul George, that narrative really works in his favor. Maybe they – cannibalize some votes for each other once he's back. Jokic, the Nuggets are going to be really good, maybe the best team in in the West. I, they were my championship pick, so don't be surprised if I end up having Jokic as my MVP at midseason. Then James Harden, it, it's by default, but it's also just out of respect for what that man can do on the offensive end. Yeah. Um, just for the fun of it, <laughs> after three nights of NBA action, do you ever check uh, basketball references MVP probability? No. Uh, later in the season, yes, but not three games into the season. <laughs> so I do it uh, often throughout the season. I don't think I've ever checked it this early. I didn't even realize they put it up this early, so it's it's hilarious. Um, number one, Donovan Mitchell. Number two, Fred Van Vliet. Is this basketball references MVP tracker or Andy Bailey's MVP probably <laughs> tracker? <laughs> um, we'll, we'll leave that to the listeners to decide. Maybe you can Google and see if I'm lying about this. Number three, Giannis. Number four, Carl Anthony Towns. Number five, Trey Young. Number six, Pascal Siakam. And here comes the best one. Number seven, Devontae Graham, Charlotte Hornets. Tony, you, watch <laughs> the Hornets. They're going to be sneaky <laughs> Kyrie Irving, Luka Doncic, and Ben Simmons round out the top ten. That will obviously change drastically over the next couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fred Van Vliet's MVP campaign is is off to a uh, stellar start. Um all right, with that, that we went through all uh, of the awards, and I think we did it quite efficiently for us. Um, if you want to pick apart any of our picks or you know, gripe to us about anything NBA-related or uh, life-related, I suppose, you can find us on Twitter. Um, I'm at Andrew D. Bailey. Dan is at Dan Favale, F-A-V-A-L-E. The show is at Hardwood Knox. Blue Wire Pods, at Blue Wire Pods is the podcast network. As always, we encourage you to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. If you have already done that, make sure you share it with your friends and family. And until next time, we leave you with the shout-out to Ben Udry and Kyle Anderson.